Our next guest has already been referenced by Martine Rothblatt. Steve Dixon is, of course, the FAA administrator, and we are so fortunate that he has been the administrator over the last couple of years. Steve's background suggests he is an aviator to the core. He's a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy. He flew F-15. He's a fighter pilot. He's also a commercial airline pilot. And at Delta, he rose to become the senior vice president of operation. He made the whole airline work. In the meantime, of course, he got a law degree. He just does those kinds of things. He's an extraordinary person. And when he walked into the FAA, of course, there was a significant challenge. The MAX fleet had been grounded. Before it was returned to service, Steve personally flew the aircraft. Can you imagine the message that sent to international regulators? The FAA administrator flew the aircraft itself. And then the pandemic hit, and all of us needed to find a way to keep our air traffic system going. How do you operate when you're ATC zero? How do you handle expired medicals and an inability get to training. We had an aviator in the left seat and he got us through. And so we are here today and we look forward to Steve's continued leadership for many years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the FAA Administrator, Steve Dixon. Thank you. I'll tell you, talk about a tough act to follow. The Mars Ingenuity helicopter, uh, Dean Kamen and Martine Rothblatt. But it is an absolute pleasure to be here with all of you today. It's, it's frankly good for the soul. Thanks to Ed, uh, his leadership, NBAA. Uh, and it's great to be live and in person, not on Zoom or Teams or something like that that we've all been living with here for the last few, couple of years. You know, I'm really honored today to share this stage with so many uh, aviation and aerospace luminaries. Uh, several of my idols are on the program today. Had a chance to have some great discussions last night and really questioned some of those assumed truths that Martine was talking about so eloquently. And, you know, each of them in a way symbolizes the part of, uh, of my job right now that I'm really passionate a lot. And some of you have heard me say before, you know, after 40 years in military and commercial aviation, I thought I knew a lot about the FAA, but I'm learning every day. And uh, I found out how much I didn't know when I came on board. But it's a great organization, 45,000 professionals who are questioning those assumed truths and moving the industry forward. You know, you think about me, uh, you know, he is... Uh, Obviously, very modest about his accomplishments, but more than a thousand patents to his name, of course, the Segway among them. Uh, he exemplifies the spirit of innovation uh, in this country, and innovation is a huge driver uh, on the FAA's flight plan at this moment, and it needs to be always. Martine, of course, is an innovator who has uh, been a trailblazer in so many areas and is literally saving lives. And, uh, She's also dedicated to advancing environmental sustainability and bringing more power to, to people through diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also accessibility. And of course, Teddy, who we just heard from, I am a huge Mars uh, Ingenuity fan. Uh, I think it's one of the few things that I will uh, turn off October baseball. I don't watch a lot of TV, I don't have time for that, but I do have a passion for October baseball. And, uh, but I will, uh, interrupt what I'm doing uh, to watch uh, Ingenuity. I remember, you know, he talked about the first uh, telemetry with the altimeter coming back, and I just couldn't wait for those first grainy images or black and white images to be built. And then it took about three days uh, for the whole video that he showed uh, to, to be uh, displayed. I mean, just tremendous uh, accomplishment by uh, NASA and, and JPL. So, you know, if NASA can make helicopters fly on Mars, you know, who's to say what we can do with vehicles here on Earth? 
And, uh, you know, it, uh, and then, of course, uh, upcoming, we'll have Rob Riggle. Now, what do you say about Rob? Uh, pilot turned Marine turned comedian. I'm not sure what that tells you. But, uh, but he personifies, I think, for me, one of the most important things. In fact, probably the most important thing. I get reminded of it uh, every time I step across the threshold uh, when I enter my house. And that's how important it is to keep a sense of humility about everything that we're doing as we go about our work. So at the, at the end of the day, you know, we're all humans. And, uh, and that's actually a major factor in how we are evolving the way that we look at safety for the aerospace system. Safety, innovation, people, environment, and facilitating new entrants uh, into our precious national airspace. So these things are all very much on my mind and again personified by those you've heard from uh, this morning. They're also a big part of the FAA's flight plan. Now, you know, you've heard a lot about innovation in the, in the exhibit halls. Uh, I'll have a chance to see some as you will uh, here over the next couple of days. It's wonderful and it's, it's uh, tremendously exciting. Uh, I think that this really is the most exciting time in aviation and aerospace, probably since the, the uh, uh, development of the jet engine, uh, if you think about it. I mean, there are just so many new vehicles and so much uh, opportunity. Uh, but then, you know, when I put on my, my FAA hat, uh, it can raise your blood pressure a little bit because there's a certain tension between rapid change and innovation and a safe, stable, uh, predictable aviation system. And we have to be able to reconcile uh, that tension. So our task uh, as a regulator and also an operator, by the way, because we run the air traffic control system, we have to nurture that innovation allow it to develop and thrive while at the same time provide an aerospace system that's safe and efficient, and very importantly, has the, the trust of the public. Because the public's expectations about aviation safety uh, are at levels that we've never seen before. And that's, that's great, uh, but in some ways, you know, we can be victims of our own success because the public expects aviation, certainly commercial aviation, uh, to be as successful and safe as the commercial airlines have become. So we know that companies that don't have safety as a core value are probably not going to be in the aviation and aerospace business for very long. So the question is, you know, how do we uh, equitably integrate all this uh, exciting new innovation into our national airspace system and do it in a safe and predictable way? How do we do it without being, you know, the traditional, uh, you know, FAA wet blanket, well, you can't do that. How do we start from yes? And how do we use innovation itself to uh, improve the margin of aviation safety? Now, before I answer that, let me give you a little bit of background. You know, picture an airplane in flight, maybe Gulfstream's new G800 or uh, the Magni X. You've got, you know, four forces uh, on the airplane. You've got lift, uh, you've got uh, the, the weight of the aircraft, you've got thrust propelling it forward, and then you've got uh, drag, of course, and a lot of people over the years would say that the FAA is actually the, uh, the drag that's pulling that uh, innovation back. Well, I'm here to tell you that might have been true for your father's FAA, but we are challenging uh, that, that paradigm. And I think the best way to look at the FAA's role uh, for today is to think of our rules uh, and our processes as a, really a protective envelope uh, that we need to operate in that surrounds the airplane. That envelope gives uh, you, the operator, the designer, the manufacturer, the pilot, um, a comfort zone within which to operate where you can be assured of a safe operation uh, before reaching the edge of the envelope. Now, we know what the edge of the envelope is. You've seen some of it this morning. And that's where safety and yours and the public's uh, might not be assured. So the question is, again, how do we bring in these new innovative entrants? Well, the answer is to make sure that the envelope is the right size. And, uh, you know, we need modernized policies, performance-based rules, very important, and regulations, and a very large dose of collaboration and cooperation with the aviation community. It's absolutely critical. Uh, we simply can't do this alone. We've got to work together. 
So we do our best uh, to allow for as much development and operational work as possible within the existing rules. This has been underway for a number of years, uh, testing out various applications, very, uh, various pilot projects with, uh, with the drone community, for example. Sometimes we find as we, uh, as we uh, test out these concepts that we need to expand or replace a rule where it makes sense to do so. Uh, think about commercial space. Uh, I did not realize when I came to the FAA the significant role that the agency has for commercial space. I always thought of that as the, the province of the government, the province of, of NASA. But with commercials, private commercial uh, vehicles, we needed to uh, update our rules and make sure they were streamlined and much more flexible. And that work is, is certainly ongoing. We did roll out a, a new rule on commercial space licensing back in March. Now this, this rule enhances public safety, but it also improves and streamlines the licensing process and it provides a lot of flexibility that enables the innovation to continue. Now by statute, the FAA doesn't actually regulate safety for the occupants of the vehicle. What we do is we work uh, really outside to protect the airspace and to protect public safety uh, and uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, so really everything else uh, outside the physical vehicle to keep the public safe. That includes licensing uh, launch facilities, launch operations, and re-entries. And the tempo, the cadence, continues to rapidly uh, increase. In fact, we set a record this past fiscal year, which ended in September with uh, 64 total commercial space license operations. That was more than double our previous record. So you can see that that activity uh, is ramping up and now we have multiple operators. We've got SpaceX, we've got Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, uh, and others, we've got Astro, others, uh, you know, around the world as well. Of those 64 operations, five were launches and, and five uh, re-entries. Um, that's, again, setting a record uh, of uh, passing the previous record of 33 in fiscal year 2020. Now, one of those launches and re-entries actually carried one of your keynote speakers tomorrow, Dr. Cyan Proctor, and she... Uh, he flew aboard a private SpaceX Dragon capsule to orbit. Now, moving back a little closer to Earth, we're also in the process of opening up uh, the envelope for Light Part 23 aircraft. Uh, and this is part of, uh, and this is a mouthful, the modernization of special airworthiness certificates. Many of you know this as the Mosaic uh, Rulemaking Initiative. And it's been underway for some time. We're working across government and with industry to write a new set of performance-based rules to allow the industry to flourish and develop and to do it safe, safely. And I want to, again, emphasize performance-based. Mosaic will do several things, but among them, it'll improve and expand opportunities in the light sports sector, as well as kits and fully manufactured aircraft. Two examples, a light sport aircraft will be able to be uh, uh, heavier weight, more rugged. It'll be able to have four seats and also an electric motor. And owners of Part 23 aircraft that are not used commercially will be able to install lower cost safety equipment, the kind that experimental aircraft owners have had access to for years. And that'll be a game changer for sure. Our goal is to get this uh, rule published by September of 2023. That's the, the task that we have in front of us. Now, you know, this is a great development, but it doesn't mean that every time we have a new innovation that we need rules. Your rulemaking is, a, is an arduous process. Uh, it never happens as fast as I want it to happen, but uh, it's necessary in some contexts, but, but not at all. And I think advanced air mobility is, is a good example. Of course, you know, some of you might refer to them as air taxis. We saw some examples earlier. Uh, electric air taxis have the potential to really revolutionize the way that we move in and around cities. We've already got several aircraft in the certification process and some companies are anticipating that they'll start initial operations around 2024. Uh, one company even wants me to come out and fly their airplane and uh, I'll probably ask Martine for a little bit of uh, advice before I actually go out and do that. 
uh, based on her experience. But these, as you have seen in some of the videos today, and as you'll see on the four, you know, these are very different vehicles. And uh, but the protective envelope concept still applies, and it's large enough to accommodate this uh, the AAM operations at least for now. Now, as we as there are more applications. Uh, and as there are more uh, opportunities, uh, there may be some other things that we need to put in place. But the initial applications, we think we can support uh, without uh, any additional policies. Now, that doesn't mean it'll be easy, uh, but we want to be uh, proactive and thinking about uh, what we need to do to be able to enable these operations. So for AEM in particular, we're managing this through five areas of activity. The aircraft, airspace, operations, infrastructure, and the community. The community uh, is an extremely important stakeholder in this process. And we've also launched uh, an internal AAM Integration Executive Council to keep a spotlight on the work. You know, one of the things that I've noticed is with, with commercial aviation, uh, we tend to do, we tend to regulate airports and airplanes and manufacturers uh, and operations separately. And so what's happened over the years is there have been various stovepipes that have developed. And we have an opportunity to really break that paradigm uh, right now. And that's what this executive council uh, is going to help us do. We also recently established what we call the Center for Emerging Concepts and Innovation. Now, as Eleanor Roosevelt once said, with freedom comes great responsibility. And, you know, we talked about sustainability earlier and uh, the role that all of us have in making sure that we have a sustainable aviation sector. Because our freedom to fly really requires us to take care of the environment that we fly in. Now, I think we can all agree that aviation's emissions need to be reduced. And I'm encouraged by all the work you've heard about some of it this morning that NBA has been doing in this area, particularly with sustainable aviation fuels, or SAF. And recognizing the need for action, the White House in September set a new goal to scale up the production of sustainable aviation fuel to 3 billion gallons a year. Now, that's a big leap because right now we only produce uh, actually less than 5 million gallons a year. So this is a tremendously ambitious goal, but it's something that we can do in the, in the nearer term. Uh, we need to put some new policy measures in place, and we are working on those uh, now, one of the ideas is this concept of a blender's tax credit that will provide a per gallon tax incentive for sustainable aviation fuel production. But there's certainly more that we can do. At the FAA, we're also researching multiple avenues for sustainability beyond SAF. Uh, we recently launched the third phase of our clean program on, uh, on uh, cleaner, uh, cleaner uh, engine technology. We just issued $100 million in contracts over a five-year period. Also, another one of those uh, NASA technology demonstrations. This is not the Ingenuity helicopter, but closer to Earth, uh, you may have seen recently that uh, we have partnered with NASA. This work goes back about uh, six or seven years on something called air, an airspace technology demonstration to reduce uh, taxi queues and uh, really harvest the performance data that the airlines have before air traffic control contacts the aircraft to reduce ground delays. And uh, we'll be rolling that out over the next few years at 27 hub airports uh, around the country. We've shown that it works, uh, but the bottom line is we've got to work together, government, industry, uh, to put aviation on a path to decarbonization. And that'll require all of us to invest uh, in sustainable aviation fuels coupled with technology, infrastructure, and certainly uh, uh, operational efficiency improvements. Now, we're also responsible from a sustainability perspective for our future workforce, right? We want to, we want to bring the best and brightest uh, into the aerospace industry. And the industry as a whole is evolving rapidly. There are a lot of new skill sets that we need. Uh, you know, the skill sets that we had uh, in terms of, uh, and that we have in terms of pilots, uh, technicians, uh, you know, and others 
are still going to be extremely important. But those roles are going to be changing uh, somewhat, and we need new skill sets. Uh, you know, we need data scientists, we need course engineers, we need current 21st century skill sets to bring into aerospace. I'm, I'm finding, uh, as I go back and talk to young people, and I'm around the country, uh, that just there really is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, barriers to entry within aerospace are really coming down. And we need to leverage that, again, to bring the best and brightest uh, into, into our industry to make sure that young people are choosing aerospace careers. There are so many, so many, uh, so many skills that we need and, and leadership. We need an industry where any young person, regardless of gender, ethnicity, geography, or financial uh, wherewithal, has a shot if they have the drive and determination to take on a career in aerospace. That's the only way to get the broad range of perspectives that we need to make sure that we haven't missed anything when it comes to safety and innovation. Now, at the beginning, I mentioned uh, Dr. Proctor's uh, space flight. I want to recognize her achievement. Uh, trailblazers like Cyan, Martin, and many others opened doors and set a great example for young people all around the world. And it's proof that if you can dream it, you can do it, no matter who you are or where you came from. And that's more important than ever right now because the demographics of the aerospace industry over time have not changed appreciably. We all know that. So diversity is actually the focus of two federal advisory committees that we launched uh, about a year and a half ago, the Women in Aviation Advisory Board and the Youth Access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force. Now, both of these groups are wrapping up uh, some very important work, and I look forward to receiving their recommendations and seeing how we can continue this work uh, to make sure, again, that we have the best and the brightest coming into aerospace. And it's a great start. And I want to thank uh, many of you uh, in the audience today who are involved in this important work. And I want to thank you for your leadership and your contributions. Uh, and then finally, you know, I've got to come back to see, right? Uh, I really appreciate uh, your help uh, and business aviation's help to making uh, aviation as safe as humanly possible. We actually just closed the book, uh, the books from our last uh, fiscal year a few weeks ago. And the preliminary data, knock on wood, shows that we had the safest year on record for general aviation in terms of the number of fatal accidents uh, based on our current metrics. But that work is never done. You know, it's always uh, your next flight is always going to be uh, a, a discrete, unique challenge. So we never want to we never want to uh, rest on our laurels when it comes to safety. But you know, I, I do have to give credit where credit's due. Uh, but we've, it's something that we've got to continually work on. Uh, again, I attribute a lot of this success to working together and being proactive and diligent using state-of-the-art risk management processes, uh, including safety management systems, or SMS as we know it, that are fueled by data. It is so powerful and we're in such a much better place than we were 20 or 25 years ago in this respect. SMS, of course, is all about using your own data to uh, figure out what your risks are, and that these concepts continue to grow and develop throughout the aviation sector, and they're here to stay. In fact, uh, we are engaged in rulemaking right now that will require aircraft manufacturers to adopt SMS, as well as the potential to require it with air stations, charter operators, and certain air tour operators uh, will all have SMS programs in the future. Now, Again, that all rulemaking process, as I talked about, takes a while. Uh, so we have set up some voluntary uh, SMS programs. If you're interested, come talk to us. I encourage, you, I encourage you to get involved. On the manufacturing side, we've got four uh, design and manufacturing companies using an FAA accepted SMS to gain that experience. This is very similar to what we did with the commercial airlines about, about 10 years ago. It takes time to ingrain SMS into your business processes and your culture. We've also got nine other voluntary SMS uh, programs uh, underway uh, at the uh, manufacturers. So there's also a great deal though, even beyond your own operation, uh, to learn by sharing your data with the broader industry. 
to uh, proactively identify trends and threats and kind of see where you stand. We do this through something that we call uh, a SIAC, the Aviation Safety Information Analysis and Sharing uh, Program. Uh, we're working on a SIAC 2.0. I want to make it more real time. I want to make it more predictive, but you know that's going to require harvesting a lot of data that we don't fully have the protocols worked on out on there. But we're gonna we're gonna continue to march toward that goal. Uh, I view the aviation system as sort of like an Internet of Things, and if we can identify where the risk factors are, we can work together to drive those risks down before we have an accident and incident. Now, with the current science program, I'm proud to say that 143 out of 188 participating operators in a science actually come from the business aviation community. Something to be very proud of. And uh, with your help, we can recruit more operators uh, this year. We also now have a third party cooperative agreement in place for smaller operators. And I was actually talking with uh, some of our friends from the NTSB about this yesterday. And smaller operators can share their data with an SMS provider as a way to participate uh, in a size. Obviously, smaller operators don't have the same kinds of, of resources, but we're hopeful that this will exponentially expand the size program. So those of you who know me have heard, heard me say this many times. You know, safety is a journey. There's no final destination. Uh, we always need to improve. We always need to get better. Now, those... Those improvements are a lot more difficult when you get up to that really high uh, percentage level of trying to pursue that next tenth of a percent uh, or next tenth of a point of improvement. But we are on the journey together, and uh, the closer that we work together, uh, we'll be able to continue to drive uh, safety improvements in the system. When you think about it, though, we're also on that on a journey uh, with equity and diversity, environment and our workforce. You know, these are things that we really have to keep plugging away on every day uh, to make sure that we're being as safe as we can, as responsible as we can with our environment, and as fair and open as we can be. And that's the path to a sustainable aviation and aerospace future. So again, thank you all for being here. It speaks volumes uh, that you're here. I, I appreciate your engagement and your leadership. We are all in this together. And have a great uh, have a great uh, next couple of days, uh, and I'm excited to uh, get out on the floor and see some of the great uh, innovations that are going on. Thank you.